May I speak in the name of our loving, liberating, and life-giving God. Amen. Please be seated. For the first few centuries of the life of the church, the Ascension, which we celebrate today, was a pretty big deal, right up there with Christmas, Easter, and Pentecost. But in recent history, this feast has fallen into relative obscurity. There are a lot of reasons why this might be so. For starters, it's not the most obviously celebratory of occasions. At Christmas, we celebrate the coming of Jesus. At Easter, his coming back from the dead. And at Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. But the Ascension is about Jesus' departure, not his coming, but his going. And what good news is there in that? We celebrate a God who walks beside us, who made us, loves us, and knows us each by name. A God who draws close, not a God who drifts away. As evangelicalism has swayed popular notions of Christianity over the last century in America, a renewed emphasis on the personhood and presence of Jesus has emerged with the effect that his absence can seem, even for us Episcopalians, somehow incongruous with the promises of our faith. But in the wider narrative of the Christian story, the ascension is unquestionably good news great news even. In fact, Pentecost makes little sense without it. The commissioning of the disciples, the mission of the church, even our ministry as the body of Christ here and now hinges on it. Jesus, God incarnate, is indeed the one who walks with us, who knows us, who loves us. But Jesus also came into the world to accomplish something something that only the world made flesh could accomplish on this earth. And on Easter Sunday, he did it. He removed the sting of death. He freed us from sin. He opened for us the way to everlasting life, to perfect reunion with God. And now his work here on earth is finished. He has done what he came to do. If there was more that he, only he could do, that we really needed only him to do, we can rest assured he would have done it after the resurrection. He had all the time in the world. He had a new body. But instead, he spends just a little time visiting with his friends, teaching, eating, talking more about the kingdom of God before he gathers them together on the edge of the city and is lifted up into a cloud and taken into heaven. The mechanics of his exit might remind us post-enlightenment folks a bit of a middle school play, but the fact of his exit answers the theological question, where is Jesus now? He is not here. He is at the right hand of God. He has once again gone before us to that place where all our stories will find their end. Jesus came to do what only God could do, and when that was done, he left. And in leaving, he left the rest to us with the guidance of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the end of the story of the Word incarnate, that is, the earthly life and ministry of one Jesus, son of Mary and Joseph of Nazareth, a carpenter, a rebel, a savior. And it is the end of the first half of the church year, which started all those many months ago with Advent as we looked forward to his birth. But it is not the end of the story. Ascension marks that pivotal turning point just in the middle of the Christian narrative, that one towards which it seems like everything has been building until you actually get there and realize that what you thought was going to happen didn't and that it all meant something slightly different, that the plot is more complex than you realized, and now you're so intrigued how all of this is going to unfold that you can't possibly look away. Which must be something like how the disciples felt, because it's clear that all the way up to this point, even as they see Jesus slipping up, up, away from them, that they never really understood him. 
All along, they expected an earthly Messiah, the promised heir of David, who would restore the kingdom of Israel and military glory and unite the tribes, ushering in an era of peace and prosperity for all. And all along, Jesus has been saying, yes, and. Yes, I am the one you have been waiting for, and no, I'm not about what you think I'm about. Yes, I am the promised one of Israel, and I'm not only concerned with Israel. Yes, I have come to do my part, and I have come that you may do yours. Throughout the Gospels, the disciples constantly misunderstand their teacher and friend, assuming his vision fits their familiar map, that his dream is already well known to them. And all the while, Jesus is busy doing a new thing in their midst, dreaming a bigger dream than they ever let themselves imagine. You might think that after the resurrection, they would have let go of their obviously inadequate expectations, but old habits die hard. And so even in this very last conversation, their final question for Jesus is, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? In other words, Lord, we've tried to be good sports. We've hung in with you and we'll do our best to follow where you go. But is it finally the time when you are going to do what we've been waiting for you to do all along? And true to the pattern of their long-standing friendship, Jesus answers them without answering them, reminding them that the Holy Spirit is coming, that they are to be his witnesses in the world, and that they have a mission that will start in Jerusalem and spread to the ends of the earth. That is how big, how broad, and how bold Jesus' dream is for them, the promised kingdom of God, not the promised kingdom of Israel. Endless, infinite, encompassing all things and all people. It's not an obviously auspicious beginning for the ministry of the disciples, that ragtag group that constituted the first church. It's a beginning full of misunderstandings, a beginning that highlights not how much they have learned, but how much they have not. And yet, Jesus goes, knowing he has done his part and as alarming as things might look, that his friends, that we, are more than capable of doing the rest, even if they don't know it yet, even if we don't know it yet. It wasn't a gamble, some cosmic roll of the dice. It was a well-thought-out move on God's part, the unpromising start notwithstanding, because God always seems to be doing what we least expect in the most surprising ways. Seven Hills is a neighborhood center in the west end of Cincinnati, a one-stop social services agency established over 50 years ago. Findlay House was one of the first communities of Seven Hills, and today it functions as a community center out of which various programs are offered. Several years ago, Findlay House set up three programs for a group of African-American youth who found themselves in trouble at home, school, and with the law. The first two were fairly straightforward, courses that would allow the youth to complete their GED and computer skills training. These had measurable outcomes and very competent teachers. The third class was intended to help these young people develop the core skills that underlie healthy relationships. The practice of these soft skills is, of course, much harder to describe or measure than a degree earned or the acquisition of technical capacities, but they are indispensable for the flourishing of young adults, to say nothing of adults. The leadership of this program was entrusted to four volunteers four white, overeducated, well-meaning adults who knew practically nothing about the lives of these young people and the neighborhoods out of which they had come. The plan was to meet for two nights a week for eight months. It didn't take long for the four facilitators to realize their curriculum was getting in the way more than it was helping them to connect. So they decided to throw it out 
and to focus first on trying to understand these kids instead of assuming they already knew what the youth needed to know and that their primary job was to hand over this expertise all wrapped up with a tidy little bow they started listening it took time but slowly the youth opened up sharing stories about their families their youth their wounds their mistakes it was hard for the adults to hear these things and to appreciate the cultural and experiential gaps between them but they stuck with it convinced that attempts to help would be futile until a foundation of trust had been established between them after several months one of the participants told the facilitators i respect you so much because you may be the only people who really listen to us participation in this program as well as the GED and computer classes was entirely voluntary and after just a few short weeks the kids simply stopped showing up for the first two classes but the third program continued to meet well after their 8 months were up and though they threw out their plan early on the youth developed strong and meaningful relationships with both the facilitators and their fellow peers they even decided together to take on making a movie about the difficult choices facing young urban youth hoping to be a positive force in neighborhoods well beyond their own so what happened why did the first two groups fail and the third thrive in his book community the structures of belonging organizational development expert peter block argues that the fate of the groups was largely a matter of leadership in the first cases those in charge assumed they knew what the young people needed that they knew what was best for them and while getting a GED or learning to use a computer both seem objectively positive no one asked the kids what they thought they wanted or needed what would be helpful to them assessed their motivation or invested any time getting to know them before the classes started in the other group the adults helped the youth to learn about relationships by being in relationship with them by modeling and discovering necessary skills and competencies together this kind of leadership requires humility patience and an openness to being changed it assumes that even the leaders have a lot to learn and that we all have things to teach each other and it seems from today's readings like this is how god intended the church to be led not by experts but by fellow pilgrims not by people who know it all but by people with a lot to learn not as an institution harkening back to when the sunday school rooms were full or the pews were packed but leaning into an uncertain tomorrow knowing that our efforts don't measure well but they do change lives jesus left because he had done what he came to do and now the hard work of ushering in the kingdom of god rooted in peace justice and mercy well it's on us with the help of the holy spirit it's a daunting order let's not pretend otherwise poverty discrimination hunger inequality disease exploitation god is grieved by these things so grieved that god joined us in our struggle in jesus so that we could actually make a difference in the world actually usher in this elusive kingdom of god but mending the brokenness of this world is our inheritance as disciples of jesus it is our birthright and it might begin with something as simple or as hard as listening to our neighbors as being present with those we don't yet know or understand as showing up with and for the stranger in our midst even the stranger within ourselves knowing we are only in the middle of the story and that we have an important part to play in what is yet to unfold after jesus ascended into heaven two men appear in white robes near the bewildered disciples and ask why are you looking up as if to say don't look up 
Look around. After all, we believe in a God who would rather be followed than worshipped. So why are we looking up, friends? Our end there is already promised. It's a done deal. Our work now, well, it is right here. Amen.